It is nice to be back at Burn Burton. It has been a few years, uh, and I hope to, as my life returns to normal, to be returning more often to Manchester and to the school. But thank you all very much, and Chris, thank you for that introduction. I don't know about being a national icon, but I am very proud to be a Vermont senator, so in that capacity, I'm glad to be here. Um, I want to talk about the book um, that I wrote, but before I get there, I want to say a few words picking up on what Chris said about where we are uh, today. So just a couple of points uh, to be made. And after um, I'm finished speaking, we have, I think, some questions that students and others have written out, and we'll do our best to answer those as well. Uh, number one, um, Secretary Clinton won the popular vote by, we think, at least a million and a half votes. All right? And the reason I say that is that uh, Mr. Trump has got to understand that he does not have a mandate. He won the Electoral College, uh, but he did not win the popular vote. Second point, which is important uh, to understand, that on virtually every important issue facing this country, uh, the views of the leadership of the Republican Party are in a pretty small minority. Let me give you some examples. Uh, we have a federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. In Vermont, it is higher. But all over this country, whether people are Democrats or Republicans or independents, they understand that we have to raise the minimum wage to a living wage so that nobody in America lives in poverty who works 40 hours a week. And on many issues, there's another issue out there where there is widespread support. You know, sometimes the media says that we are a divided country, and in some respects we are. But in many economic respects, we are not. I'll give you another example. Right now, women in America make about 79 cents on the dollar compared to men. Minority women, African American and Latino women, make even less. There is a widespread belief that in America, the time is long overdue for pay equity, equal pay for equal work. <laughs> in America today, as all of you know, and I know the students know this, we live in a very competitive global economy. And the economy is changing, technology is exploding. And if our country is going to do well today and into the future, we need the best educated workforce in the world. And a significant majority of the American people understand that we need to make public colleges and universities tuition free so that anybody could go to college regardless of their income. And almost everybody understands that we have hundreds of thousands of bright young people today who have the ability and the desire to get a higher education, but they can't, and they can't for just one reason, their families lack the income. And the second issue tied to higher education is that many young people who do graduate college or go to college leave school deeply, deeply in debt. Now, I've talked to doctors, and I've talked to dentists who left dental school or medical school, three, four hundred thousand dollars in debt. Talk to college graduates who left school fifty, eighty thousand dollars in debt, and they have to pay off that debt year after year after year, and they can't get a home, they can't get married, they can't have kids. And I think there is a growing understanding that in this country we have to encourage everybody to get all of the education they need, not discourage people by making it harder to go to college or to leave school deeply in debt. There is also an understanding that while our economy today is better off than it was eight years ago, and some of the young people may not, may not remember where we were eight years ago, but eight years ago, at exactly this time, 
We were losing 800,000 jobs every single month. 800,000 jobs, that was unprecedented since the Great Depression. Eight years ago today, we were running up a $1.4 trillion deficit, the largest deficit in the history of this country. And eight years ago today, not only in the United States, but all over the world, we were worried about an international global financial collapse in which people would put their, eight, their credit card into an AP, ATM machine and nothing would happen because of a global financial collapse. We are better off today than we were eight years ago. But here is the main point that I want to make. The media and most people in politics, while we can agree that we're better off today than we were eight years ago, there are enormous economic problems remaining in Vermont and 49 other states around this country, and we don't talk about them enough. So to the young people especially, what I want to tell you is you are living in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. That's where we are today. Wealthiest country in the history of the world. But most people don't know that because almost all of the new wealth and income is going to the top 1%. And to the young people, I want you to think about and I want you to discuss whether or not you think it is sustainable, whether or not you think it is immoral that the top one-tenth of one percent, not one percent, one-tenth of one percent, now owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. At a time when we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major country on earth, in the last 16 years, the number of billionaires in this country has grown by tenfold. Used to be 51 billionaires, now there are 540 billionaires. And yet we have in Manchester and Burlington, you got senior citizens trying to get by an 11 or $12,000 a year. What does that say? Billionaires growing up all over the place, and yet people living in desperate poverty, old people not being able to afford the medicine that they need, kids not being able to afford to go to college. We have more income and wealth inequality today than we've had since 1928, and it is worse than almost any major country on earth. But we gotta deal with that issue. Is that the kind of country we are comfortable with? Do we think that type of economics is sustainable? And when we talk about the economy, just think about things. Let's just say you are a single mom or a married mom and dad living in Manchester, living in Burlington. Let's just say a couple's making $80,000 a year, pretty good. Do you know how much it costs to send a child to childcare today? Who knows the answer? What does childcare cost? $211 a week. <laughs> Sounds like somebody is paying $211 a week. All right, that's over $10,000 a year, which, by the way, from a national perspective, is on the low end. All right, we had a woman working in my office, my Washington office. She was sending her baby to a good quality childcare in Washington, D.C., a lot more expensive than Vermont, $32,000 a year. All right, but you're paying $12,000 a year. All right, so it may be 15, it may be 10,000. So if you're making 40 or $50,000 a year, the state of Vermont has made some efforts to improve the situation. But nonetheless, just think about that. Think about trying to get by, I'll tell you a story. A couple of years ago, I was in Detroit, Michigan. And I had a town meeting with some young people, mostly African-American young people. Talk to people, young people, who are working at McDonald's for $7.25 an hour, and they couldn't even get 40 hours a week. They were working 20 hours a week, getting on a bus, going to another McDonald's, getting on a bus, going to another McDonald's. There are millions of people in this country who are trying to make it on eight, nine, 10, $11 an hour. And if you multiply that by 40 hours, you conclude that you just don't have enough money to survive. In urban areas all over this country, I was in San Francisco recently, and even in Burlington, the price of affordable housing 
the need for affordable housing. Very great people are spending 40, 50 percent of their incomes trying to get a decent place in which to raise their kids. If you talk about health care, it's not just that we have 28 million people who have no health insurance. There are many people in this room who have health insurance but have deductibles or co-payments that are so high that in many cases they can't even afford to go to the doctor. And the result of that is that thousands of people a year end up dying because they go to the doctor too late. I've talked to doctors all over this state who will tell you that people walk into the doctor's office and the doctor said, why didn't you come a year ago when you first felt your symptom? The person said, well, I didn't have any health insurance or the deductible was too high. And then the issue situation becomes terminal. People end up in the hospital. There are millions of people in this country who go to the doctor and get a prescription. What happens when they get a prescription? Anyone want to guess on that? They can't afford to fill the prescription. One out of five people in America cannot afford to fill the prescription because the pharmaceutical industry charges us by far the highest prices in the world. Half of the older workers in America, people 55 years of age or older, who are going to be retiring in 10 years, do you know how much money they have in the bank as they await retirement? Who wants to guess? None. How do you feel if you are 55, 60 years of age, you're a little bit more frail than you used to be, you've got some medical problems, you're going to retire in five years, and you've got nothing in the bank. Now, I say all of, and I'll give you some other examples, because as a candidate, I traveled all over the country. And I saw things that I just did not know about. I went to the Pine Ridge uh, Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Anyone here want to guess what the life expectancy is at Pine Ridge? It's, it's in the high 40s. It is the equivalent of Guatemala, a poor third world country. I was in Baltimore, Maryland. Tens of thousands of people in Baltimore are addicted to heroin and they have no treatment available. In fact, I was out in an evening before an event, we walked through a neighborhood that people who run for president don't usually walk through. And the, in the Secret Service had some very sophisticated weapons available because it was not a nice neighborhood. And in the evening, every evening, as everybody knows, that whole area later on becomes a drug bazaar where people are busy selling drugs quite out in the open because you have a massive drug epidemic in Baltimore. Um, I was in an area in um, West Virginia, southern West Virginia, called McDowell County. It used to be coal country, it used to be coal mines there. People made a living mining coal. And in McDowell County and in Kentucky and other regions of the country, there is something that is going on which is what we call ahistorical, it hasn't happened before. What has happened in the last many, many years is every generation lives longer lives than the previous generation. My generation lives longer than my parents' generation. My parents' generation lived longer than their parents' generation because improvements in public health, improvements in health care, for example, we've made real progress in treating cancer, et cetera, et cetera. People live longer. Do you know that there are many, many millions of working class people in this country who are now seeing a reduction in life expectancy. They are now living shorter lifespans than their parents. And the answer has a lot to do with despair. The answer has a lot to do with these folks, if they're able to get jobs, are making 10, 11, $12 an hour, going nowhere in a hurry, worried to death about their children, and many of these people are turning to opiates and heroin. They're turning to alcohol, and they develop all kinds of liver problems. And they are turning to suicide. Now, I say all of these things not to depress everybody in the room. I don't. But when people talk about why Donald Trump was elected president, these are some of the reasons why. 
We live in a very much what Washington, we use a term, I don't know how prevalent it is, it's called a siloized world, which means that you live over there, you live over there, you live over there, you don't know what's going on over there, and you don't know what's going on over there. So what I have just described, the fact that so many people can't afford health care, they can't afford prescription drugs, they can't afford to send their kids to college, they're wondering how they're going to pay to keep their lights on today, that's a reality that many millions of people don't know. Because there's another group of people who are doing pretty well. If you're in the top 1%, the top 2%, economically, you are doing quite well. You don't worry about how you're going to send your kids to college. You don't worry about how you're going to drive with gas in the car to get to work. You don't worry about those things. But it is important that everybody begin to catch on what is going on to millions of people who have been forgotten, who have been left behind, who are not making it. And not only are they not making it, they're looking around them and they say, I'm working two or three jobs. Not uncommon in Vermont. And yet almost all new income and wealth is going to the top 1%. So these are issues that we have got to be thinking about. Because if we leave those issues undiscussed, and if we let demagogues come along and say, I will take on the establishment, I will do this, I will do that, bad days come to the country. So where we are right now, in this moment, there are a couple of things that I think we have got to do. First of all, as a nation, and, and I hope the young people are studying this, is to understand that as a nation, for hundreds of years, we have struggled with all forms of discrimination. All forms of discrimination. From before the time when this country became a country, when the first settlers came here, we all know the terrible things that were done to the Native American people. They were lied to, they were cheated, and their treaties that they signed were abrogated. And by the way, that continues until today. That's the Native American people. Everybody here knows the ugly, unbelievable history of slavery and segregation and all of the horrific things that were done to the African American community. Young people should know that 100 years ago today in America, women were not running for president of the United States. They did not have the right to vote. They did not have the right to go out and get an education or the jobs that they wanted. 50 years ago, if you were gay in America, you hid that reality. If you were Italian 100 years ago, or Irish or Jewish, there was prejudice against you and other nationalities. And one of the great struggles that has taken place in this country over a period of hundreds of years is the attempt by wonderful people, brave people, some of who gave their lives in the struggle, to create a less discriminatory form of society. Where to paraphrase Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we judge people not by the color of their skin or their nationality or their religion, but by their character, who they are as human beings. And that has been a struggle. And we should be proud of the progress that we've made. We are today a much less discriminatory society than we were 50 years ago, than we were 100 years ago. We take it for granted that we have an African-American as president of the United States today. If I were here 30 years ago and somebody suggested that, people would have said that could not happen because there's too much racism in America. There's too much homophobia in America. There's too much sexism in America. We have made progress. And maybe the main struggle that we have at this moment, as Mr. Trump assumes the presidency, is to make certain that we continue to resist all forms of bigotry, that we're not going back, we're going forward. <laughs> and the second area, in terms of Mr. Trump's presidency, that I worry very, very much about, and I say this as a member of the U.S. Senate Committee on the Environment is uh, his, uh, his views on climate change. Uh, Mr. Trump campaigned uh, stating that he believed that climate change was a hoax. Mr. Trump is dead wrong. 
Uh, the scientific evidence is now overwhelming, and virtually every scientist who studies the issue understands that not only is climate change not a hoax, it is the most serious environmental planetary crisis that we face. And what the scientists are telling us loudly and clearly is that if we do not get our act together, if we do not transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy, we're going to see more drought, we're going to see more extreme weather disturbances, we're going to see more flooding, we're going to see more acidification of the ocean, which is just unto itself a huge problem. We're going to see more rising sea levels, which are really going to impact cities like Miami, New York City, other coastal cities around the country. So what we have got to do is demand that Mr. Trump start talking to scientists, not just representatives of the fossil fuel industry. Um, what the book is about, it is two parts, uh, part one and part two. Part one, for those of you who are interested in politics, it talks about um, how you run a campaign for president and what happens. And when uh, we began uh, this effort, uh, I knew a lot about how to run for the U.S. Senate from the state of Vermont. And I knew a lot about how to run for Congress, because I had done that. I knew a lot about how to run for mayor of Burlington, because I won there four times. But let me assure you, running for president of the United States is a little bit different than running for the Senate from Vermont. Uh, America is a bit bigger than our state. And uh, we had to learn very, very fast. And when we began the campaign, one of the problems that we had is that the media and all of the pundits had said, well, you know, Bernie Sanders is an interesting guy. He combs his hair really nicely. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, he's not really a serious candidate, because we know there's only one candidate who is going to win the nomination, and we don't have to take him very, very seriously. And that was one of the problems that we had to uh, address. Uh, but as the campaign progressed, uh, as we started off in New Hampshire and Iowa, and went around the country, it turned out that there were a lot more people who were really upset uh, and, in fact, disgusted with status quo economics and status quo politics, and they wanted real change. And this was true of a lot of working people. It was true of a lot of young people who had a vision of this country moving in a very, very different way than status quo politicians were thinking. And as we began to move around the country, the turnouts that we had uh, and our rallies became larger and larger and larger, uh, culminating in a rally in Portland, Oregon, uh, where we had, it was at the, uh, at the arena where the, um, Portland, Tra the uh, Portland Trailblazers play. It's a three-tier arena. It seats, I think, 28,000 people, and the place was filled up. And we had large rallies in Los Angeles and Seattle, all over this country. And it became clearer and clearer that we were moving, we were making progress, and we ended up, at the end of the campaign, are winning 22 states. And the victory, I think, that has given me most pleasure is that here in the state of Vermont, we won 86% of the vote. And that was very, very moving to me. Um, in fact, it turned out that the way the Democratic primary process works is if you don't win 15% of the vote, you don't get any delegates at all. If you win 16%, you get some delegates. This was the only state in the country where one candidate uh, did not win any delegates at all. <laughs> but we ended up uh, the campaign uh, with about 46% of the what's called pledge delegates, which reflects the popular vote, 13.4 uh, million votes. And I guess what really um, moved me the most and, and, and makes me most optimistic is in every state, we won the overwhelming majority of young people, white and black and Latino, Asian American, Native American, we won overwhelming support among young people who want to see this country move in a very, very different direction. So what the, <laughs> so 
So the campaign, we talk about how we start off with a few people not knowing much about it and how the campaign progresses. Um, and the second part of the book is, is different. What it does do is what I think we need to do as a nation and what the media, corporate media, almost never does at all. And that is to start discussing the most important issues facing our country. Now what corporate media does and what is easiest to cover is to deal with personality. So if I'm running for office and I make some kind of vicious, ugly attack against my opponent, it's very easy. Sanders says da 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 da, opponent, that's easy to cover. And if you know, I raise a certain amount of money or there's a poll that comes out having me do well or badly, it's easier to cover. But what the media does not do, and there are reasons for this, and at the end of the book, if you get to the end of the book, or skip over, <laughs> read the chapter on corporate media. Because what it will tell you is that media spends almost all of its time on personality and very little time discussing the most important issues facing the American people. And we have got to demand a change. We need, you know, we can disagree on everything, but at least we're gonna lay on the table what the issues are and how we move forward. Now, some of the issues are, to me, the movement of this country toward an oligarchic form of society. Who knows what I mean by that? Any of the young people know what I mean by that? What do I mean by oligarchy? What is oligarchy? I see a hand, well that's, let me get a young person, way, a young lady way in the back, yes. Stand up, be loud, yep. An oligarchy is a ruling by a group of people who hold that are friends or allies or business partners and not a group of people elected by the vast majority of the population. Whoa. Good. Okay, who wants to build on that? Young people. <laughs> That's good. It's a good answer. Is the, am I right or am I not right? Is the United States moving toward an oligarchic form of society? Who wants to add to that? Yes. All right, let me get some hands. Let me get to the kids first. Young people, students. All right, I got a young man over there. Stand up, be loud. In true Vermont form, short and to the point, right? Okay, didn't want to elaborate. All right, what I think, and the book deals with, with some of this stuff, and what it essentially comes down to, if you look at the economy, you see a small number of very, very large multinational corporations controlling a lot of the economy. If you look at media, for example, when you turn on TV, <coughs> you know, if, you got, you know, if you're paying a fortune for cable TV, and you've got 100 channels. Some people think, oh my goodness, 100 separate channels. Isn't that diversity? Look at all the points of view. Got. Who do you think owns the 100 channels? Just a handful of entities. In fact, the six major media conglomerates, Time Warner, et cetera, uh, CBS, the Viacom, um, Rupert Murdoch's uh, network. Those, you've got about a half a dozen media conglomerates that control about 90% of the information you receive that you see here and read, 90%, okay? If you look at Wall Street, you've got a handful of banks, six banks that have assets equivalent to 58% of the GDP of this country, issue most of the credit cards, a lot of the mortgages that people have. And then it, politically, what's happening, again, to the young people politically? What has happened in recent years? to give big money and trust even more power than they have today. Any young people know the answer to that? Do we got any? What is Citizens United? Anyone know what Citizens United is? All right, tell me what Citizens United is. Stand up. Citizens United is the Supreme Court making a decision that corporations are equal to people and they have independent expenditure. Ex excellent, that's right. So at Citizens United, is a, by a five to four Supreme Court vote, and obviously one of the great concerns that we had about this election is that in the next several years there will be a number of Supreme Court justices appointed by uh, President Trump. Uh, by a five to four decision, what they essentially said is that corporations and billionaires, anybody, has First Amendment rights 
freedom of speech rights to spend as much money as they want on an election. So, if a multi-billionaire is supporting a candidate, and you have multi-billionaire families like the Koch brothers, how many young people have heard of the Koch brothers? Raise your hand. Good. Okay. This is a family worth some $80 billion who believe that we should end Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, federal aid to education, the environmental protection agencies, and basically eliminate virtually everything that the federal government does except maybe military, um, a, a, a strong military. Those are the most powerful political people in the country right now. And they can and do spend unlimited sums of money on House races and Senate races. And for many Republicans, that is not enough. What they want now is to end all campaign finance regulations. The young man was correct in saying right now, all the Koch brothers can do is do independent expenditure, put as much money as they want on TV that they pay for, but they can't give more than a small amount to an individual candidate. They want to change that. What they want to move to is the day when a billionaire will be able to say to a candidate, I'm giving you a billion dollars to run for president. There is your campaign manager. There is your speechwriter. You are my employee. I am paying for your campaign. Or I'm going to give you $30 million to run for the US Senate here in Vermont. You work for me. That is the direction in which we are moving. And that is called oligarchy. Now, the other issues that we talked about in the book is health care. Question again to the young people. How many countries, major countries, are there in the world that do not guarantee health care to all people as a right? Raise your hand if you know. Any young people know the answer to that? OK, stand up. Just the one. What country is that? OK, all right. So the first question that we have to ask ourselves about health care is why I live in Burlington, 50 miles north of me is Canada. They provide health care to all of their people as a right. So do they do that in France, in Germany, in the UK, in Sweden, Holland, Finland, Norway, Denmark, in every major country on earth. So I want you to think about, and the book talks about why we are the only major country and why we end up spending much more per person on health care. The book deals with climate change and my great fear about what happens if we don't transform our energy system. The book deals with a broken criminal justice system. Young people, what do I mean by a broken criminal justice system? Anyone know? What are some of the symptoms of a broken? Yep, stand up. People are being put into prison for crimes that are very minor. Good. All right. What else? That's a very good point. That's a very good point. What else? What other aspects? Yep. Way back there. Yep. Stand up. It's a revolving door prison system where first time offenders can be prison. Excellent. It's called rate, very high rates of recidivism. Other questions? Other responses? Yep. Private corporations run many prisons, right. OK, other questions, other, other responses to that? Yep, ma'am. Stand up, please. White-collar people don't go to jail. Excellent. OK, other comments on crim broken criminal justice system? Yep. There's a disproportionate amount of black men going to prison. Absolutely. OK, I, that's great. You guys, I don't want to spend all morning on this, but I think you touched on a lot of the issues, and also the issue of overuse, I think, of lethal force by le local police departments, which should be the last response, not the first response. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is how does it end up that we have more people in jail than any other country, more than China, which is four times our size, and it's a communist authoritarian country? And why do we have, as the young man mentioned, a high rate of recidivism? And why is it that if somebody, it turns out that the black and white communities smoke marijuana at about equal levels, but if you're black, you're four times more likely to get arrested. And as the woman just mentioned here, how does it happen that if you smoke marijuana, you can end up with a criminal record, but if you are a CEO on Wall Street who has engaged in illegal activity that helped destroy the economy, you don't get prosecuted. What is that about? All right. And
and an issue that is going to be surfacing very, very uh, soon, an issue that I will be heavily involved in, is the issue of immigration reform. And it's an issue that does not touch Vermont as much as it does many, many other states. And I have to do a lot of learning on this issue. Uh, what ends up happening is that we have right now about 11 million undocumented people in this country. Many of them are working in agriculture. They're out picking tomatoes or planting crops, feeding America, actually. And when you are undocumented, you have no legal rights, which means that your employer can exploit you, uh, not even pay you the minimum wage, overwork you, underpay you. Um, and we have people who are undocumented contributing into Social Security, not getting any Social Security benefits. Bottom line is, I was in Phoenix um, talking to some young Latino kids, teenagers, and maybe younger, and some of them were crying as they expressed their fears that one day they were going to leave school and go home and find that their mother or their father uh, has been deported. So this is a very big issue that we have got to address, and in my view, what we have to do is move toward comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship. But this is an issue that we don't discuss too much. I mean, it's very different here in Vermont than it is in Arizona or in Texas, California. Uh, but it's an issue that is going to surface very, very soon, and I intend to play an active role in it. Okay, I've talked for more than I, uh, longer than I should have. Uh, let me start off, uh, Chris, um, whoever it is going to ask some of the questions. Okay, Chris. Our community is struggling, like the country, to come together after the election. The political division is everywhere, and many of us are having a hard time accepting opposing political views. What advice do you have for us so that we can move forward and come together? Good, good question. All right, I think there is less political division than media makes it out. Now, as I began my presentation, what I said on most of the issues, most of the economic issues, whether it's raising the minimum wage, whether it's protecting or expanding Social Security, whether it's lowering the cost of prescription drugs, uh, there is widespread support. There really is. Where there is the vision, and there is, there is the vision in this country on issues like a woman's right to choose. Vermont historically has been a pro-choice state. I have a 100% pro-choice voting record. That's what I believe, and I think that's what, not all, but that is what most Vermonters believe. But that is not necessarily true all over this country, and there is a division on that. Now, I think, and that, that's just a fact, so there's a division on a woman's right to choose. That is a real division. There is a division on issues dealing with the gay community, LGBT community. Vermont, as you know, and I think personally we should be very proud of this, has been a leader in the country in terms of what was first called civil unions and then became gay marriage. And most Vermonters, not all, most Vermonters feel comfortable with that position. That is not necessarily true. But even on that issue, even on that issue, as my opponents on that issue will tell you, they are losing that fight because the younger generation, including younger Republican kids, who know gay people, who do not want to see prejudice and, and believe that people have the right to marry, this is very much a generational issue. All right, so the kids themselves don't see any problem with gay marriage, their grandparents do. So the future, I think, is for a more tolerant and open society in that regard. There are differences of points of view on guns. But even on the, you know, there are some people who believe that they have the constitutional right to hold a nuclear missile launcher in their backyard. <laughs> All right. But even on the gun issue, and Vermont has virtually no gun control, by the way, on the issue of guns, there is overwhelming support for background checks to make sure that guns do not hand, end up in the hands of people who, through criminal reasons or, or mental reasons or domestic abuse reasons, should not have those weapons. The vast majority of people, gun owners or not, understand that. So sometimes I think where the confusion lies on this issue is the following. And I, I, I'm being partisan here more so than I want to be. 
but I think it's, I have to be to answer that question. And, and check it out to see if, double check what I'm telling you. But if you go to the, uh, Google it, you'll find that the Republican leaders today in Congress, they want to, in many respects, cut Social Security and Medicare and give tax breaks to billionaires. And those of us who represent 80, 90% of the people in opposition to that, you know, this supposedly creates a great deal of division. There is not division among the American people. If you did a poll today, uh, you know, I was in uh, Illinois the other day. You do a poll in Illinois, do a poll in Mississippi, conservative states, vast majority of the people do not think we should give tax breaks to billionaires and cut Social Security and Medicare. But you have a Republican leadership that wants to do just that. So, in some ways there is division in this country on some social issues, but I think on economic issues there is a lot more unanimity and commonality than most people think. With the balance of power stacked against the Democrats, what has become your top priority? Well, it turns out, to be a surprise to the people of Vermont, because I've been an independent my whole life, is I am now part of the Democratic leadership. So. And the job that I have been given is uh, to be the chair of the outreach effort. And essentially, you're quite right, and, and where we are without going into a great long exposition on this, Democratic Party uh, lost the White House, lost the U.S. Senate, lost the U.S. House, and now controls about one-third of state houses around the country. And uh, I think the Democrats are going to have to take a very hard look at why that is happening. So where I'm going to be focusing right now is to rally millions of people all over this country to come together to make sure that we prevent Mr. Trump from doing some of his worst ideas and we come together and fight for a progressive agenda. The Trump candidacy is it's a very, very interesting phenomenon. Because to give Mr. Trump his due, he took on the leadership of the Republican Party, took on the leadership of the Democratic Party, took on the corporate media in many ways. Now, a lot of what he said was wrong. We should take on the corporate media, but not for the reasons that he suggested. One of the problems, and again, I don't mean to be overly prejudiced, and I'm not the only one to say it. Republicans will tell you, he seems to be a pathological liar in the sense that, and I say that not happily. A lot of Republicans are not. They are not. They believe what they believe, and we live in a democratic society. But, you know, he says things which are patently untrue, just not factually. And when the media would call him, up, call him on that, he would get angry at the media, and I hope uh, you know, I hope that's something that he understands uh, just cannot continue. We can disagree on issues, but you just can't keep lying all the time. All right, second, uh, second issue is this whole issue of bigotry. And again, to what degree these were simply efforts to win votes among certain groups of people, to what degree he deeply holds these views, nobody knows, I don't know. But what we should know and be concerned about is that before he ran for president, he was a leader of the so-called Bertha Movement. Do you all know what the Bertha Movement is? The Bertha Movement was a, a, an effort to try to prove, which was a lie, that President Obama was not born in the United States and was not qualified legally to be president of the United States. So this was an effort to undermine the legitimacy, not disagree with Obama, but undermine the legitimacy of the first African-American president in our history. That was a racist effort, nothing more, nothing less. The language that he used to describe Mexicans as rapists and as criminals was disgusting. Uh, his uh, belief that we should somehow prevent one of the large people from one of the largest religions in the world, Muslims, from entering the United States is not only unconstitutional, uh, it is an ugly position. And again, as I mentioned early on, 
as a nation, we have struggled. Some of you, the young people, don't know this, because this is how much the world has changed. 50 years ago, 70 years ago, some guy wrote a book, wrote a PhD thesis at UVM, and it talked about, you know, what was going on in Vermont or in the Burlington area in the 1930s. It was a big deal in the 1930s when Catholics were able to work in the banking industry. Big deal. And if a Catholic boy and a Catholic girl and a Protestant girl went out together, that was somewhat scandalous. All right. But we have come a long, long way in doing away with religious prejudice and racial prejudice and, and gender prejudice. I mean, if we were here, the idea that a woman running for president 50 years ago would have been unthinkable. It's a woman named Barbara Mokulski today, United States Senator from Maryland. When she first entered the Senate, she was the only woman in the Senate, only woman. Today, I think we have about 20, and that number obviously has got to expand. Women deserve half or more of the representation in all elected positions. We are making progress. We have a long way to go. But my point is we do not, that worries me. I do not want to see this country divided. You know, little girls, Muslim girls with the hajibs, I don't want to see them being fearful, and that is the case today. Muslim kids worried about being beaten up or being picked on, bullied. That's a direction that we cannot go back to. We have gone through too much pain in this country. Too many people have suffered. And we don't want to see this nation divided up by race or religion or, or nationality. Yeah. Youngstown, Ohio, typical of many working class towns, voted for Trump by 20 points. How do you explain the shift of the working class blue collar voters away from Democrats? Well, I think I did when I spoke. And that is what I think the Democrats have lost contact with is the pain that a lot of working class people are feeling. So if you live in Youngstown, Ohio, and I visited that community more than once, it used to be a major industrial community and people had decent paying jobs. Well, those jobs by and large are no longer there. They're in China and they're in Mexico. I'll give you an example. And this is the way people feel and they're right. And they're right and everybody here, we used to have in Springfield, in Rutland, many parts of this state, Burlington, we used to have decent manufacturing jobs. Workers were made decent wages. Those jobs are gone. I can't remember the exact statistic. I suspect we've lost 25% of our manufacturing jobs, which were better paying jobs than many of the service jobs. Right now, give you an example. This is why working class people are angry. In Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, there is a company called Carrier. They uh, make uh, air conditioners, among other things, and furnaces. Here's the story. They're now owned, they were taken over by United Technologies, a major corporation a few years ago. United Technologies made $7 billion in profit last year. They pay their CEO $14 million a year in salary. Three or four years ago, their former CEO left. I don't know why, maybe they thought he wasn't doing a good job or what. He got a $171 million severance payment. $171 million. And then last year, Carrier and United Technologies announced that they were leaving Indianapolis, Indiana. They were throwing 2,100 workers out on the street and then moving to Monterey, Mexico to employ people there for $3 an hour. Now, if you're a worker who's worked in Carrier, who's earned decent wages, who saw a CEO get a $171 million severance package, knows that the companies today are profitable in Indiana, and this happens all over the country, how do you think you would feel about a political system? Do you think that the politicians stood up for you, or did they cave in to the CEOs whose greed has no end? So all over this country, if you are a male worker, a male worker, you are making less in real adjusted inflation income today than you made 43 years ago. You're working your backside off, you're worried about your kids, you're making less money. Are you bitter? Are you angry? You have every right in the world to be bitter and to, angry, and to be angry. So I think that is one of the reasons that Mr. Trump did so well among those people.
The next question was about the Electoral College. Um, you claim to be a democratic nation, yet for the fifth time in our history, the candidate with the majority of votes has lost the general election. And additionally, the Electoral College discourages people from voting in several ways. Why has the Senate allowed this antiquated system of voting to continue, and what is your opinion of Senator Boxer's bill to overturn the Electoral College? Well, I think we have to do a lot of thinking about the Electoral College. But some of it comes back to Vermont. I mean, when you talk about the nature of representation in America, it's a big issue. Um, right now, um, we have two United States senators, Senator Leahy and myself, uh, with a population of 620,000. Uh, California, I think, has something like 30 million people. They have two United States senators. Now, I personally think that's a great idea. <laughs> but there are other people who may disagree with that. All right? So this is, I mean, this is built on, we have in the United States Senate, in fact, it's ironic, I'm on the uh, budget committee, I'm the ranking member, leader of the opposition. Uh, the guy who's chair of, of it, Senator Enzi of Wyoming, uh, he is the chair and I am the ranking member <laughs> Between the two states, we have less, I think, than a million people and a lot of power, and there are people who, you know, do not think that that's exactly right. All right, so the point that the questioner made is absolutely correct in this sense. Look, most of us believe that the person who gets more votes than the other person should be the winner, right? Well, Hillary Clinton got a million and a half more votes. She's not the winner, all right? So that has to be really dealt with, and, I, and that's one issue. But I'll tell you the second issue because I was heavily involved in the Clinton campaign. I ended up going to 12 states and giving 21 speeches in the last week of the campaign. And that is, think about this one. Right now, politics in America comes down to about 15 or 16 so-called battleground states. So California, no one pays any attention to, because everybody knows Democrats are going to win there. Vermont, the same. Clinton won by 25 points here. Massachusetts, the same. But in New Hampshire, which is a battleground state, everybody worries. They worry about Florida, and Pennsylvania, and Ohio, and Michigan, and a number of other states. So those states get a lot of hearing. People pay attention to their needs, but not so much Vermont, or Massachusetts, or Wyoming, or North Dakota, which are Republican states. Is that a good thing? I don't think so. When we have a presidential race, we would hope that attention would be paid to every region of the country, every state of the country. Uh, that's not the case as well. So to answer your question, it's an issue we have to think a whole lot about. But at the end of the day, there is a serious problem uh, when a candidate who gets a million and a half more votes than somebody else is not seated as president. How long did it take you to write your book since you're occupied with running for president? Because <laughs> I had to get back to work, but... <laughs> How do you go about telling someone that they're wrong? I wrote, uh, after, um, in late July, I was in Philadelphia, where the Democratic Convention was, and where I ended up uh, endorsing Secretary Clinton. Um, and then I went to work on the book for about three months, working uh, very long days, you know, being a U.S. Senator and writing the book and so forth. Uh, so it took me about three months, which for a long book is a fairly short period of time, actually. So if it is not as good as it should be, forgive me. <laughs> but it's pretty good anyhow. It's pretty good. Uh, well, I think, well, you're wrong in asking that question. <laughs> One of the very ugly things Look, the world is changing very rapidly. Technology you know, is changing a whole lot of things. The young people here will be shocked to know that when I was elected mayor of the city of Burlington in 1981, all right, you ready for this, young people? There were no computers in City Hall. <laughs> there was no email. When we wrote to constituents, we actually wrote letters that went into something called the United States Postal Service and were delivered by mailmen, and sometimes it would take two or three days. I mean, think about how the world um, has changed. But 
one of the things that happens now, and there's a whole profession involved about when we talk about politics, uh, my opponents, and this is, we didn't do this, but most people do do this, and it's a very ugly and disgusting thing, but it is a reality. It's called opposition research. Now, opposition research, the good part of that is if I'm running against somebody who's an elected official, I have every right to know, and you have every right to know, the votes that he or she has cast, right? If you're going to run against somebody, you want to run on the issues. Why did you vote for that? Why did you say this and so forth? But opposition research goes very deeper than that. It goes into every, every aspect of your life, uh, personal stuff, uh, and distortions and lies. In fact, it, you know, there are hundreds of pages of opposition. I've learned more about my life by reading the opposition research <laughs> than I knew about my life, going way back. In fact, a woman, I just was talking to a woman the other day who I'd gone out with. Um, no, not a joke. I'd gone out with her in the early 1970s. She got a call from a media person trying to get some gossip. It was 40 years ago. And that's, that's, so that is an ugly aspect of politics, and it works on every, on, on all sides. And I think what we as citizens have got to demand is that we stay focused on the issues. Why is the middle class in decline? Why do we have so much income and wealth inequality? Why do we not have a national health care program guaranteeing health care to all people? How can we improve education and make college more affordable? How do we create millions of decent paying jobs? I mean, we can agree roughly on what the issues are. We can debate how you go forward. But I think what we need is civil debate, respectful debate on issues, and less ugly personal attacks. Under President Obama, we made some progress, not enough. Uh, and I'm happy to tell you that along with Senator Boxer, whose name surfaced a moment ago, I introduced the most comprehensive climate change legislation uh, in the history of this country. Now, here is what makes this stuff really difficult and complicated. It needs a lot of discussion. The United States of America could do all of the right things. But if China doesn't do it, and India doesn't do it, and Russia doesn't do it, you know, the atmosphere doesn't know whether the pollution is coming from the U.S. or from China. So it becomes a global crisis. Now, having said that, the good news is, is that China and India and Russia, not Russia so much, actually, China and India do understand uh, that uh, climate change is a very serious issue. Some of you may remember, I think it was a year or two ago, where in China, in Beijing, I think it was, the hospitals were flooded with people who are breathing air. And I know people who have gone to China came back really sick because the air is so disgusting and it's so filthy. And, and people are getting sick and dying in China. And the government there is aware of these things. But what we need is a planetary response. And what does it mean? It means, and we have been doing this in Vermont, but not enough, and I you know, help bring some money into it. We have buildings and homes that are not energy efficient. I'll never forget, I was uh, at an event with uh, two older sisters. They must, sisters, they must have been there 80 years old and buried. And they've been living in a home for years. And we managed to get the home weatherized. Their fuel bill went down by 50% because you know, the wind was coming right in through the, through the doors and through the walls and through the roof. So if you weatherize, if we invest in weatherization, we cut substantially the amount of fuel we use in terms of our transportation system, to the degree that we electrify our transportation system, which is going to happen. It, we are moving that way. Um, that's what Tesla is about, to the degree that we move to solar and wind. And I know that there is a lot of debate in this state and around the country. But I honestly believe that if we are serious about combating climate change, Vermont has got to be a leader. I believe we've got to move to solar. I believe we have to move to wind. I believe we have to move to geothermal. We've got to get other states doing the same thing. So I think the answer is massive weatherization and energy efficiency, significantly making our transportation system more energy efficiently, efficient and moving aggressively to wind, solar, geothermal, and other uh, sustainable energies.
Do you think it is possible or desirable for us to have a third party, and if so, which would be the most viable party, social democrat, progressive, or another kind? Well, you know, um, in Vermont, we do have actually um, maybe one of the most successful third parties in America. It's called the Progressive Party. Um, and there are now at least three people in the state senate, and our new lieutenant uh, governor, David Zuckerman, uh, certainly comes from the Progressive Party. So we have probably made more progress than any other state in the country. And I think we got that started way back when, when I was a mayor of Burlington. We took on Democrats and Republicans. Uh, it is starting a third party within the context of contemporary American politics is not easy stuff. It is very, very difficult. So what I have been trying to do is to bring about uh, major reforms within the Democratic Party, and that's what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to make the Democratic Party a true party of working people uh, to stand up to the big money interests. What is the most effective thing our students and people of this generation can do to help ensure the future of our planet, our rights, and our democracy? What can young people do during this new administration to effectively preserve the civil rights of their fellow Americans? Now you've got the young people all very nervous. So we, we put a big burden on them, but uh, I think, and it's not just young people, it's all of us. And I, you know, it's a hackneyed expression and I use it often, but it's a true expression, and that is that democracy is not a spectator sport. And democracy is not just coming out to vote every two years or every four years. Democracy means essentially that every person in this room is a very powerful person if you choose to exercise your power in whatever way. When people stand together, they have power. So what I think for the young people and for all of us is to determine what are the issues. If you are concerned about climate change, for example, how does Vermont become a leader in this country and in the world in transforming our energy system? What are the proper steps? In the book, we have a chapter devoted to that. I have my ideas. Other people may have other ideas. If we believe that health care is a right of all people, it's an easy expression, good expression. You get applause for that. How do you create a health care system which is cost effective and provides quality health care to all people? How do you do that? These are tough issues. But what I would say to the young people is you will find that if you start thinking about these issues and jump into these issues, one of the gratifying personal experiences that I've had, I was just up in Portland, Maine the other day, and I cannot believe the number of people who came up to me and said, Bernie, thank you. As a result of your campaign, I ran for school board and I won. Or I ran for the state legislature, I'm thinking of doing this. But what I guess the message is, it's not just running for office, although that's important. It is thinking about other ways that people can come together to improve life in our society. And it's not change if you study history. Never ever comes from the top on down. It always comes from the bottom on up. So I say to the young people and all people, get involved in every way you can. I, uh, I'm really happy to be standing here. I was going to be in North Dakota and uh, chose to be here, actually. My question is, how can we move forward, stand up for the people that are protesting there? Um, how can I stand up in my community? How can we stand up in our community? What are you going to do about it? I know that it's not right when a police officer throws a, a percussion grenade to a lady who is handing out water bottles and her leg becomes shattered and needs to be amputated. That is not right and it is not being covered by the media. My great grandfather was a U.S. Senator, well, I mean a Vermont Senator, Carlton Howe. My sister goes to this school and uh, I, I'm honored that you're taking the time to answer my question. I think if you go to my website, you will find that we have been the leader in the United States Senate in opposing uh, the Dakota uh, Access Pipeline uh, for several reasons, for three reasons, actually. Uh, and we have been supportive, and we've urged President Obama to be much more aggressive in protecting the protesters, who you are right, 
have been mistreated. There's just been a huge military presence. They're spending millions and millions of dollars uh, trying to uh, push around the people who are protesting. Uh, the issues there are the sovereign rights of Native American people. The issues there are water and whether a pipeline goes through an area where if that pipeline broke, it would pollute uh, the water, clean water, for millions of people in that area. And the third area, maybe the most fundamental, is should we be building more pipelines for the transmission of fossil fuel or should we be transforming our energy system away from fossil fuel? So those are the reasons, and that's why I am in opposition to the pipeline. As you know, Vermonters are both independent-minded and community-oriented. We will work hard for a better state and country over the coming years. Where do you recommend we start? Well, you're right. Vermont is all, uh, in, in both respects, are very independent. Minded. If they weren't, I certainly would never have been elected as the longest serving independent in the history of the United States Congress. And also very community, very community minded. And I think one of the beauties we have as a small state with many small communities is people know each other as human beings. Teachers and principals know the kids. And I think, I've said this a million times, that I think this small state can, and we are beginning to do it, become a model for what the United States of America can be. Right? And that is, you know, this is tough. We're a small state, that's 630,000 people to be figuring out about how, when communities come together, we have the best education possible, how we make colleges affordable, but et cetera, et cetera, how we deal on climate change. But the fact that we're not a city of seven million people, which makes it much harder for people to come together, but we're a small state. And you got a legislature where everybody knows who their legislators are. There are extraordinary things that we can do. But I, I would just say, I'm not gonna suggest A, B, and C. There are just enormous numbers of issues out there. But what is imperative is that we exercise democracy with a small d, that people get involved, that young people get involved uh, in any way that they can in attempting to address some of the very, very serious problems that we face. And if we solve them, or we make progress here in Vermont, that word spreads all over the country in five minutes. Everybody watches what everybody else is doing. So this small state can play, and has in many ways, played a major role, you know, whether it is a gay marriage, whether it's our environmental legislation, et cetera. We have and we must continue to play a major role in leading this country to a more democratic, inclusive future. Thank you all very much.